here for 20 years and then went into state administration at that point. And I um, <clears throat> uh, was really nervous about the career cluster model. And you all know from being teachers what that is. And, uh, and there was no apparel and textiles. And I kept asking, where's apparel and textiles? And they'd say, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, where's fashion design? And, like, and well, it, it fits here. Well, where does the sewing fabrication fit? Well, it fits under manufacturing. So it was like such an interdisciplinary field. They really didn't have a place for us because the Kerr cluster model didn't allow for multidisciplinary recognition of career areas. And so I've worked for over 20 years to try to get recognition for the field. And I finally just kind of threw up my hands and then I met Mike and I said, okay, Mike, um, <clears throat> hi, it's who I am and I'm a state administrator and I'm very frustrated about this. So I'm just gonna do something for my own state and try to bring professional development and uh, make connections with business and industry for my classroom. And then I started to share it nationally and uh, helped um, John and Mike with their work. And Jolene, who no longer, I believe, works with Windows Wear, but she was instrumental in, in providing some of the tours and things that we had. Um, but her aspirations in life were uh, in the theater and she actually got some um, opportunities and, and is able to do that. So we're very, very happy uh, for her. But I have a presentation I'm gonna share with you this morning and it's, all of those background pieces that uh, I was able to research and put together for Windows Wear um, related to business and industry and how what they do fits into your classroom. So I wish we had uh, a better video so that I could ask you what states you were from and, and what you've gained this week, but I don't even need to ask you that because I know it's been a phenomenal experience based on when I was in New York with, uh, with some teachers uh, some of you might have heard this, but my daughter is in the industry. She's actually up, up in bridal. She's an associate designer for a company. And uh, she's the one that, that really uh, allowed me to further understand the business side of the industry. Our um, professional, professional training has traditionally been very heavy in the understanding of textiles and fabrication, which is a fancy word for sewing and uh, apparel wear in particular, but maybe not broadly, more broadly in the textiles or actually the other components. So that's what I'm gonna share with you this morning. Of course, now it's not advancing like it did earlier. I don't know why. So let me, may have to stop sharing and come back in. I'm sorry for that. We thought we had it all ready to go. And it obviously decided something different. So, okay, let's try this again. Okay, still not doing it. Just a second. I'm going to go ahead and just tell you what we're doing while I'm trying to get this up. So the next slide I was going to show you had to do with, um, uh, let me get out of this and then I'll start back again. <clears throat> Is, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the industry and the industrial uh, side of it, the business side of it, and then I'm going to go into the 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 uh, need for the field because it is a high need field, and um, then we're going to talk more about how FCS aligns and having to do with looking at the um, ability to let me go try to see if I can share this now again. The ability for FCS to meet the industry and the needs that they have, and then uh, some lesson plan um, reviews. So do you see an agenda slide now? Yeah. Okay. How about this? Is it apparel versus fashion? Yes. Do you see that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I, I do want to start off with uh, some definitions. And in the past, Fashion and apparel were not used together. Fashion really meant high fashion, uh, couture designing. It was for a single uh, customer, or it might have been someone who uh, you might think of when you watch something that had a red carpet and someone was, was uh, high fashion and wearing something designed by a design house. When you said apparel, that was more of the manufacturing component and producing uh, ordinary clothing for the broad variety of individuals or the masses. 
But in present day, the fashion industry means all of that. Fashion is the design of the product, the prototyping, the manufacturing, the distribution, the marketing, the retail, all segments of the population for all products. So we're talking menswear, outers, outerwear, children's wear, specialty wear, which is bridal or costuming. Um, all of that is considered fa the fashion industry. So when we're talking about this area, we really need to start utilizing some correct terminology and call it the fashion industry. There's four segments. <clears throat> Do you see the four segments? Okay, I just got, want to double check that you're seeing what I see. So thank you so much. So there's four segments in the industry. One is the raw product production, and that is everything from raising um, the animals to shear for their fleece, to growing the cocoons, to the, the silkworms to, to get silk from the cocoons, um, the, the growing of cotton for obviously cotton, and then the manufacturing of man-made fibers or the hybrid uh, products that we have that are as a result. The, the second segment after we have the raw product is actually the design. And actually I shouldn't say when we have the raw product because this industry, all four of these segments move back and forth and impact. So, so they, the promotion and sales impacts the raw product because if we have a lot of sales of cotton, they're gonna have to increase there's supply of cotton, so that means the raw product, we have more uh, uh, farmers growing cotton and so forth. So uh, I, when I said that, I, I really misspoke. It really does impact each other. It goes forward, it goes backwards. It, it's all, it all works together, which is why the Kerr cluster model piecemealing all of these out separately does not work to embrace the, the, um, the industry. So the second one is design, and this is where I, think on, in an FCS world, we spend most of our undergraduate time in our professional development. Um, it's the textiles themselves. How are they made? What are their characteristics? Uh, how do you design? How do you sketch a design? Color and color theory, uh, knowing what colors uh, during certain times of the year are more popular. Um, the detailing of a garment, what makes something uh, more attractive uh, if it's a white cotton product, uh, what appeals to different individuals? Because you have a basic white cotton t-shirt that has a variety of necklines, and then you have a very high-end silk white blouse, uh, for instance. So the detailing uh, makes a difference, and the trends keep changing, uh, and that's really hard to put a finger on, but Windows Wear does that ex really excellent uh, job at that. So um, you don't have to worry about the trends, just stay attuned to Windows Wear and they'll do that for you. Uh, the, how do you develop the garment line, uh, the runway and line release, which commonly we call fashion shows, uh, is very important and we have some experiences in that. But the manufacturing and promotion and sales are really what Windows Wear brings to you as a resource. And what we, I think is really our weakness in our background and training. And that's why I thought the professional development in New York City with Windows Wear was so vitally important to bring teachers to because if you introduce this industry to your students, where would be the very top experience they would have in the United States? And that would be to work in New York City. Now, it doesn't mean they physically have to necessarily be there they can do work other places, but if their hub is New York City, they need to know what that means. Well, how does how do you know, how do they know what that means? And that's through you, their instructor. How do you know as an instructor is you need to go to New York City and have these experiences? So in the manufacturing realm, we're talking about the sourcing of product. We're talking about the detail manufacturing, the technicians uh, work in uh, in producing garments. Uh, the fabrication itself, that meaning the making of the garment. If it's one of a kind or more of a couture or, or a beginning designer, the fabrication could be done on a small um, production floor, maybe 10 or 12 people, or even smaller than that when the entrepreneur is first starting out and might only have three or four people, including themselves, making the garments in order to fill their orders. And then that works all the way up to mass production where someone is making 1,500 to 5,000 pieces. 
uh, for an order uh, for Macy's or um, uh, Bloomingdale's or or what whatever the the buyers are buying. Uh, promotion and sales is huge, and Windows were so, just such an excellent job of staying on top of of what's going on, how people are promoting their product, how they're using online sales, uh, pop up shops. Um, some of the e-commerce opportunities that Windowsware uh, has captured where you have access to videos of des uh, design houses who are putting together packaging um, in a way that when you receive it, when you're at home and you're unwrapping the, the package, you're having a similar experience as if you're in the, in the store. And um, they're spending lots of money on developing those things. And, and we'll see in a minute how e-commerce is so huge for the industry right now. But merchandising, that's both, how do you merchandise it in, in only a visual way through an online platform or a website, as well as merchandising in a brick and mortar store where you'd actually walk in and you see things um, uh, trying to entice you to, to purchase. Uh, the store itself and, and the layout of the store is very instrumental in, 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 in promoting their product. Uh, advertising is everything from the color of the background and the color of the, of the um, hangers that they use, as well as the product itself is in the displays <coughs> that they have on mannequins and things. And then the sales process, of course, itself. Um, and we're going to talk more about that. But raw product commonly is not something FCS does. Design, we have somewhat of a background, but also the design, the manufacturing, and the promotion sales is something that we don't have a lot of good resources for, especially one that can stay on top of those trends that continually add to their resource in a way that we can have access as FCS teachers. And that's what Windowsware does, in my opinion is uh, when I found Mike and I started to think about what he was offering in, an, in a way to really introduce this field to my, to my students. When I, if I was a, had been teaching at the time, I'd been out of the classroom since 2010. But to bring it to the teachers I was working with as a state administrator and say, hey, you don't have to know everything, but you need to know where you can go to find the right information and you need to know the information is current. And that's what Windowsware is really good at. So, <clears throat> What do we all know? People um, in administrative roles, in decision-making roles, have a tendency to think sewing is quilting, which in a lot of people's minds is, is hobby. And also there's no money in sewing. Well, this were sample careers. And at the bottom of the page, uh, all of the data points that I'm sharing with you, um, and I'll share this um, <clears throat> PowerPoint with John so he can send it out to all of you has a link to the resource. So you can go to the original and find out more information if you'd like to the original source. So I just looked at the last three segments, design, manufacturing, and sales and marketing, and just randomly picked some of the uh, careers that they that uh, fit under each using the undine.com finding a job fashion industry careers. So these are very current as far as um, titles and um, uh, salary or wage per hour. And you can see there's nothing that's less than uh, 15, what is it, $15 and 70, 70, 77 cents. Well, that is over and above any of the limitations that I've heard nationally that um, our administrators or individuals using the career cluster are capping uh, or seen as a minimum income for including any career that they think is vitally important. So these are high skill jobs that do make a living wage, which indicates that this is a career that needs to be embraced. This is another um, article that I found, and this is just a, a snippet, as was a screenshot that I took of one page of all the jobs. And a lot of these are different from the previous slide. So, if you can you can think about it from the range of jobs, there's a there's just any number of them. There's also jobs that have the application of apparel and textiles. So those individuals, it may be a journalist 
but the journalist is writing about apparel or, or writing about design houses or writing about fashion or about textiles. And they're gonna have to have a, a working knowledge of all of that. Um, sometimes they put journalists in different career clusters, but if you're looking at it from this industry, they still have to have that basic skill set. A buyer can't buy for a retailer or a design house, or excuse me, not a design house, for a uh, brand store uh, if they don't, if they're not able to identify good fabrication skills, um, patterns that match at the side seam, finishes of the seams uh, adequately done enough so that it's not going to fall apart, um, the pattern placement on a garment so it's not um, a ridiculous vision of uh, something that shouldn't be where it, where it makes the garment look completely different on the body than it does hanging on, a, on the sales rack. So um, again, the industry and, and what you teach is so vitally important. So what does that mean when it comes to the industry itself? <clears throat> Uh, and, and from an economic point of view. Well, globally, uh, this is a global market. And that's the other issue with career clusters is has a tendency to focus more on regional or local jobs and not so much multi-state, regional, national, nationwide, or global um, industries. And that's uh, really a discredit to the industry which is another reason why I'm, I've been forward thinking and trying to get this message out to you all, but also do uh, more um, acknowledgement at the national level at some conferences and things, doing some sessions. Nationally, it's $1.2 trillion industry annually. There's only one industry that's really bigger than this globally, and that's automotive. But yet we don't have our own career cluster. It just blows my mind. Uh, it is, uh, there's $2 trillion value to the global economy, which is mean, which is huge. 3.38 uh, million people are in the workforce. This is globally. And this is from entry level seamstresses all the way up to high technical skilled employees, many of which uh, obviously this embraces the other slides that showed those particular careers. There's 300 billion textile garment companies entering the market daily. Now, this doesn't mean they're new. It just means every day there's 300 billion companies doing something related to apparel and textiles. It's the first, fourth largest industry in the world, but when you look at it from a value, um, uh, economically, there's only one larger, and that's uh, automotive. In the U.S., <clears throat> annually, it's a... Uh, $359 billion industry. That's on average. But in 2019 alone, it was 380. This is an industry that's very consumer driven. And so it's really hard to put a thumb on uh, if it's growing. It, we know there's always a need, but is it to meet some of the other qualifications for the career clusters? Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But there's 1.8 million in the fashion industry, uh, workforce in the United States. <laughs> People say, well, we don't manufacture clothing anymore. There's no manufacturing. Well, we have over 100,000 people working in this uh, global in uh, manufacturing in the United States alone. That's a lot more than some engineering areas, which are considered high need or valuable. Uh, so, if you're looking at the sheer number of of people in the workforce, it definitely hits those markers. We export about six billion dollars in product, but we import about eighty-two billion. And sometimes I think individuals focus on that, and that to them says that there's no jobs because we import so much more than we export. But what individuals don't realize is <clears throat> only manufacturing really left, and sourcing of product they could no longer find in the United States is what the imports are, the reason we have the imports. Uh, the, the designers, the marketers, the media specialists, um, the, the um, color, colorists, um, the, uh, all of those pieces did not leave the United States. Just manufacturing and the manufacturing in particular of fast fashion. So that's fashion that comes in out in style and out of style. The trend is very short and uh, made it a very lower quality. So the price point can be lower. So um, it could be mass produced at a, as a, at a, so when it's resold or when it's sold in the United States, 
they're able to make money, but they're made, made money on the vast number of items that they're sold, the pieces they've sold rather than necessarily a lower number with a higher quality. But we know the made in the USA uh, concept <clears throat> is growing stronger every year um, and has been for some time. And right now there's actually a couple laws back in DC uh, with our legislators to entice companies to reshore uh, or onshore, whatever word you want to use, their manufacturing components back in the United States. So, uh, and part of that has to do with some international resource laws that changed, and which meant they could no longer use the mass quantities of water, and uh, there had to be some treatment plants that they didn't have to use before, you know, earlier. And so, when they're looking at all of those pieces that they have to now meet, all those um, mandates. Um, they're looking to reshore to the United States because if they're having to redo or rebuild or replace, um, now there's incentive to bring it back to the United to the U.S. And also, I wanted to point out, made in America is not the same as made in the U.S. Made in America means it's made in either North or South America, uh, part of a NAFTA um, marketing a piece that came in about 20 years ago, 30 years ago, something like that. So made in the USA means it's made in the United States. Just want to point that out. <clears throat> so the impact of online shopping, or I like to call this brick and mortar stores are closing does not mean there is no need for this industry. Um, online shopping is huge, which means you still need the garments. You still need the trend to know the trends. You still need the design lines. Uh, it's just instead of a brick and mortar store, a person goes into, you pick up your phone, you pick up your laptop, you put in uh, a black shift dress, and uh, you see what's out there. <clears throat> so I thought this was really interesting. Sorry, I'm just getting over a, uh, a cold, so I'm going to pop in a cough drop, but I apologize. Normally, I wouldn't be eating or anything, obviously. Um, this came uh, uh, recently um, talking about the uh, online value. This is a global number. 2021, uh, there was almost uh, $760 billion spent through online shopping. They expect that to be over a trillion dollars in 2025. Um, and a lot of that is due to um, individuals, let me back up, uh, individuals that are entrepreneurs. And this also has opened up the whole world of uh, uh, shopping direct to customer, which means, and especially our younger generation, <clears throat> is feeling very much pulled toward working directly with a design house or with a new entrepreneur. And they're able to purchase items through Etsy and also through uh, design uh, small design houses having their own niche market and um, uh, web websites that you can go to. And sometimes they'll have pop-up shops in different areas with media coverage. And so you're actually bypassing the large design houses uh, and the mass produced um, uh, department stores uh, and big box stores and uh, go right to the person who's, who's uh, designing and, and selling their own product rather than have these other people involved. So for that reason, it's important that we think about entrepreneurship and how we include this in our conversations with our students. Um, entrepreneurship is, is running your own business, finding a need that's not being met, meet that need, and then produce it and sell it in order to make money, you hope. Uh, entrepreneurship has a skill set that is commonly linked with our business uh, counterparts. But the business counterparts um, commonly don't recognize fashion and industry or fashion and apparel as um, the experiences they give their students in a business department, unless it's pre-made items like t-shirts or something like that. This entrepreneurship concept is looking at it more from the design, more as the pop-up uh, store person. Uh, that's what you could bring to the table. You could partner you, with your business teacher or business department, but in your case, you're looking at this from the person becoming an entrepreneur, not necessarily having that experience like your business department would, would have as having, say, a school shop where they're just learning the business side 
they're not actually designing the product necessarily. They're just learning how to sell. So I want to make sure that you understand that if you go back to your schools and you want to add this into your program, um, the differences between that. I really need new clothes. Everybody says that every morning, which means there'll always be a need for this particular industry. So the current trends that kind of relate to why this industry is so important uh, for you to bring back if you don't have it or expand in your schools is fashion is constantly evolving. We always have a need. Um, in fact, I was just thinking to myself today, it's kind of rainy in Helena. There's a couple stores that are having some some summer uh, open houses, if you will. And there's a certain a couple of things I'm like, yeah, I really, I'd really like to have something new. And uh, so I'm planning later on today to go hit that. But it's not that I don't already have enough blouses or dresses or jeans. It's just I, there's trends that are out there that I really like. I'd like to try and see how it looks. So everybody says that all the time, and they always will. When you look at it from a children's point of view, there'll always be a need for children's clothing. And I don't know how many of you do children's clothing as um, as part of your uh, fabrication or sewing or, or um, classes, but we really should because uh, it takes less fabric. Um, it, yes, it's a different body shape, but uh, children do one thing and that's grow. So they're always going to need new clothes. So they're always going to be needing new designs to kind of keep things kind of current. I have a granddaughter. She's 18 months. I always find such cute stuff. And I'm always sending it, uh, sending it back home for her. Um, she has a little pair of bell, bell bottoms. That's just the cutest thing because she, had, you know, just learned how to walk not too long ago. Anyway, uh, so the need is always there and it's always evolving. That also includes individuals that have a specialty need. Uh, and that would be your senior citizens, for instance, that might have uh, lost mobility. And so they can no longer use their hands to use buttons. So um, when we're talking about things evolving, people still want to look nice, even if they can't utilize their hands to, use, you, to be able to work buttons any longer. So how do we meet those needs? You could do that through entrepreneurship and some of the, that exploration. E-commerce is huge, like I mentioned before about the, the design houses, the, excuse me, the uh, brand stores, uh, when you order things uh, are bringing it to you where you have an experience when you open product. And Windowsware has a whole section where they've actually purchased things from some of the, the, um, the brand um, companies and actually unwraps them uh, and has recorded that so you can see that experience. Uh, I ordered something recently from uh, Bloomingdale's and it was a particular um, uh, type of um, makeup um, that I had bought when I was in New York City and I was out and I, I ordered it online. And it came in this, this cool little box uh, with a bow and you open it up and you had the smell um, when I opened it of when, when I went into the, into the store. And it was just really, really cool how they were using the, the colors to... Um, and the opening experience made you feel like you were in the store. So e-commerce is huge. It's, it expects to grow over a trillion dollars. And by the way, a trillion is a thousand billion and one billion is a thousand million. Just so you get an idea how big this is. As far as growth is unpredictable, they do grow, uh, expect this industry to grow over 70% between now and 2025. But again, that's a projection. And if you look in 2021, the actual growth for actual commerce was 26%. And e-commerce was almost 30%. So they make this projection, but you just never know how it's going to actually, uh, what's going to actually happen. Reassuring is huge. I already talked to you about that. So these jobs uh, could come into your communities. And there are some jobs, some individuals who are entrepreneurs that are always looking for seamstresses and people who can produce their garments. And so there's a good chance that a person could stay wherever you are. You could be in a very remote area, but as long as you have internet and you have access to UPS or uh, the postal service and um, you're able to um, have electricity and, and a sewing machine, uh, you can make product for people anywhere 
uh, in the United, anywhere, actually. You could do piecework and then and mail it back. And the entrepreneurial opportunities are huge uh, for the industry. And how unfortunate would it be if, because of this misunderstanding of apparel and textiles, you're led to believe you shouldn't be teaching these skills. These are very technical skills. And once someone learns them, they can use them in a variety of ways for person for their own personal use, but also as an entrepreneur in the in the future. So yes, it is a high need field. And yes, it is important to think about all four segments and how you're able to bring that uh, to your students. There are barriers, as we know. And one of them is people don't understand this industry. So I'm hoping that some of what I'm sharing with you, you'll be able to turn around and share uh, with your advisory committees and with your community and or with your school board or your administrators on why you not only need to have a sewing class, but you maybe need to have several so that you can help these students gain these technical skills so that they could become an entrepreneur uh, in the future. So what are we gonna do about the barriers? Well, there's a number of things, but one of the things that I was able to do um, is answer the question, what is the industry skill set? Uh, and I did a lot of research and this is what I came up with, which I feel very comfortable that um, it embraces everything that is considered the technical skill set that our programs should be introducing or helping the students to master. It is based foundationally on um, uh, a skill set that a list that I found, and I have the link at the bottom of this page, but I did add to it and, and expand it. So one of the things for people, for uh, students to understand is the scope, meaning the four segments of the industry. Uh, then it's very complex and it's also very personal. Clothing is very personal. And so that makes it a whole different category than selling um, a couch or selling a car. So when people say, well, we have this other uh, entrepreneur or business class that's talk about marketing and selling. No, the product that's clothing is very personal and that makes it more human services than anything else. Sketching and using the design elements and principles is an industry skill set, especially if you use croquis. Now, I don't know how many of you use these. You can find them online. Croquis are sometimes called nine heads. Uh, the the uh, um, human body, and we're talking about this as a adult male, female body, um, is if it's fully proportional, your, your body is eight of your size of your heads, your head. So your head is a one head, and then the rest of your body is equal to eight of the same size of your head. So in other words, a fully proportional body is called an, um, is sometimes called a, a, a nine head as far as a drawing. It's, it's an outliner shape. Uh, it can be forward facing, it can be side facing, it could be facing from the back, but having your students draw on croquis, uh, you can get a piece of, uh, 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 filament paper or drawing paper that's thin, you can put it over a croquis and they can draw. So when the paper comes off, um, you don't see the lines or you can use an actual croquis and have them practice on it uh, with uh, you know colored pencils. That's what the industry uses. And um, there's all sorts, uh, in the beginning phase with your students, you'd use pencils. The, the industry itself actually goes into more of a watercolor pencil in order to get shading and that sort of thing when they're, when they're selling product or trying to come up with a line learned that from my daughter. But croquis is real important for individuals uh, to practice with when they are sketching. Um, the students really should have a good understanding of fabrics, embellishments, textile characteristics, and textile care. That will very much impact all of the things that they are be going to be asked to do as a designer. Sewing and equipment use is very important. How do you take a flat piece of fabric a flat pattern and turn it into something that can fit a three-dimensional body. So the garment is three-dimensional. That is an abstract concept, but there's techniques we know based on predecessors uh, and their use of, of technique for sewing. But equipment in a sewing use, uh, Christmas, so basic sewing and how to use basic equipment it's foundational to everything. If you know how to thread an actual sewing machine, like a, a residential sewing machine, it's very similar <clears throat> to thread a commercial machine. 
but it's going to be different in the fact that the, the spools of thread are larger. Um, the uh, the take-up lever is going to be in a different place, but as long as they know what a take-up lever is um, and a bobbin and or and the, those types of things, then, then they can transition that as they use some industrial machines. But that whole fabrication process of taking a flat piece of fabric and turning it into something that will fit a body uh, is uh, quite a feat and something that you you uh, traditionally you've been very good at. Alterations is, is also a way to understand how to fit a human body. <clears throat> Male, female, children, older individuals with physical constraints um, all can uh, or will be probably needing some types of alterations. We are all not, we're all not the same height. We're not the same size. Um, shoulder width, I have my dad's shoulders. Uh, so that means I basically have football shoulders. And so it's very difficult for me to find some things uh, in women's clothing because uh, traditionally women have had smaller shoulders than I have. So I know you all have other physical features that you have a tendency to, to struggle with. A friend of mine had a very uh, small waist. And so to fit the rest of her uh, body when she was buying jeans or slacks, um, the waist would be way too big. And so she had to figure out a way to either, she did a lot of her own home sewing for that reason, but how do you alter ready to wear things so it would fit her body um, too long uh, in length? How do you shorten things? Uh, as well as uh, placement of buttons need to maybe be moved around. The alterations is a really good way to learn a lot of smaller techniques without having to invest in all of the other equipment. So that might be a good place to start. Although it's not very sexy for kids to do alterations, it, they, their interest level might not be really, really high uh, to do alterations. But if you can say that it's a, a continuum, you learn these things and now we're gonna go over here and do this and we're gonna use those same techniques, then they might um, be able to embrace that a little bit more. Inclusion and diversity. Making sure that you recognize and um, embrace the uh, cultural and religious limitations or expectations of your students um, and body shape. Making sure if you provide patterns for them to use, you have patterns for the very, very small and you have patterns for the larger students um, so that they feel included and don't feel um, that they are less than or feel have an emotional re response or feel ashamed in some way. When we went to, um, when I took Kansas to Windows to the professional development that you are all at, we went to um, a shop that had, was just opening and it was based on inclusion and diversity. And it was, it was the coolest thing. I never had this experience before. And, I, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it. John, you may, and you can, you can add it. But um, <clears throat> it, um, they had garments, one of every size from the very, very small to, to quite large. You found, if you liked a garment you wanted to try on, you could, it was like a sample. You would try on something that might fit you, uh, but maybe the, the, the pant legs were too long. And so if you ordered the clothing, if you wanted to purchase something, you ordered it. You ordered the size, but you had a different length um, for, the, for the, the pant leg. And then uh, your order would be submitted and then the garment would be made to fit you and then they would mail you the garment. So you didn't leave with the garment. And I just thought that was fashion, fascinating, but it really fit this inclusion diversity piece. Um, another example is when you have a company um, that uh, has underlinings for garments and only has underlinings that would match more of a lighter skinned wearer of the garment rather than have a variety of darker uh, uh, linings so that the person could actually match their skin tone um, is another example of how to include the inclusion. And I did find that um, uh, Crayola, I believe it is, makes a set of flesh colored colored pencils i think they're i think they call they're called colors of the world but um that's when you're coloring in skin tone in your croquis um i believe there's 24 different color tones 
it's very fascinating and cool. So you might want to think about that to uh, add into your, your resources. Sustainability concepts are really big. This is something my daughter has shared with me that uh, when she was first uh, out of college, they were really starting to look at water use and redesign and recycle of product. Um, and there are some stores now that if you bring in old denim jeans, you will get a certain percentage off a new pair of jeans if that's what you're coming in to purchase. And they're recycling those. They're sending them back uh, to companies and they're doing other products with them. But that was a way that that particular company was doing kind of a recycle uh, piece where you bring in your old and then you could buy a new and kind of minimize the, the footprint um, of the um, uh, carbon and different things that you're using. But water use is, is a big one uh, and, we're, and everyone's getting real concerned about that. So you can see a lot more about water use because there's a lot of water in manufacturing textiles. There's a lot of water used in the dyeing of textiles and, the, and, the, um, and there's a lot of use in the care of a lot of water used in, in the care of garments. So that you're gonna see a lot more on that, I think. So that's a big trend. Fashion shows, um, why is it important? That's something your students need to understand. Not that it's just something that you do at the end of the year and everybody comes in or the community is invited. And, uh, but why is it important? And make sure that the experience is actually put together as if you're promoting sales. Uh, and so you might need a little bit more background on how to make that work. Communicating and work with, with, working with others is huge. So anytime you can do team type projects, if you have a FCCLA chapter, they do have uh, some, some, a variety of, of uh, star events and skill development uh, contests, materials, but you could just use it in the classroom, have students do things in teams rather than individually, and they start to develop some of these, these uh, particular skills because communication is huge. And being able to communicate with a variety of people and speak exactly the way leading to what you need is something you need to develop because it's not as easy for some people to be able to actually formalize and communicate what they need to another group who may or may not have any under basic, basic foundational understanding. The financial and business understanding of un what is a price point, the development costs, how do you decide what to do based on to keep the price of a product down? Uh, anytime you have students do a product, do you ask them to price it out? And how much is this, this going to cost you? Um, also, uh, that could also fit in, we could fit in some basic wardrobe investment strategies. Uh, a white scoop neck shirt. Uh, cotton shirt that a person owns would purchase. How many times could you use that? Uh, how many wears could you get out of that? Um, would it does it launder well? So would a ten dollar scoop neck white t shirt would be, would that be a good investment, or would it be better to invest in one that's thirty dollars that launders well because the because the uh, textile um, content. Uh, allows a little bit more flexibility. It has some spandex, so it's going to keep its shape. Um, would that be a better investment? Would they be able to wear that for years and years, years and years because it's very much a foundational piece um, and not so much trendy, um, but more of a conservative piece that they could utilize? So some of those interactions would help students understand investment, understand the business side from a consumer to begin with, because that makes it personal, but then how to, can you provide some of those opportunities to understand if they were gonna be an entrepreneur and actually sell a product? And then of course, the entrepreneurship piece we already talked about, how do you identify trends? Uh, trends are commonly related to colors, um, the fit, closeness, the fit to the body or the, the more loose fit, uh, the length, <clears throat> of uh, skirts or pant leg, the, as well as the width, uh, the, the size of um, uh, sleeves, as well as um, the, uh, the size of um, the um, buttons and the embellishments that they use. All of those are trends. How do you identify a trend that's coming? A lot of trends repeat in history. So every 20 or 30 years, you'll see some type of trend come back. 
And so uh, how do you help your students understand historically, what does this mean? And then also the promotion of a product like window displays. How do you do that? How do you do the investigative work to know if this is a new product or if someone else has already come up with that concept? <clears throat> and so those are just the industry skill set. And some of those things you might be able to pick and choose and offer um, in your cl particular classrooms. But knowing what they are, I think, is very important. And that potentially will help you know how to expand what you're already doing and know that it's aligned to the industry. Why Windows Wear? Well, Windows Wear is an industry that is aligned to the what we need access to in family consumer sciences. They had a variety of things that I've, some of which I've already talked about. One of the things they have is very relevant webinars. They can set up live webinars. They have archived webinars um, that uh, you can access uh, with your uh, subscriptions to utilize in the classroom. If there's something that you want, you can just reach out to John and uh, he can see about making it happen. What's cool really too is John can find people who are actually doing the work. Like if you said, for instance, um, I'd like to have a webinar on how stores decide uh, how many products that they're gonna purchase, how many they're gonna order. He could potentially find someone who works in the industry who does that work and provide uh, the answer to you, but also could do potentially a webinar on it that you could live, you could show with your classroom or uh, one that's archived that you can show whenever it, it in particular it fits in your um, your unit or your your syllabus for that particular class. The webinars are really really well done. They have examples of photos, so it's very much a multiple learning style. They'll tell you about it as well as have photos, uh, so you know what it actually means. So that kind of hits that um, that teaching strategy that we all have of teaching things in a different in several modalities. Um, to find the, and there's all kinds of things. I mentioned the e-commerce uh, opportunity. There's also archived displays uh, from Windows. They have, it goes back to, I believe, 1930s. Is that right, John? Yeah. Uh, so if you're doing historical research on a particular designer, if you want to suggest that your students pair up and they investigate the differing uh, pant leg widths over time, you could assign them and then you could go into their archives and you could look up uh, different store windows which are displaying their product. Um, you, could, uh, you could talk about things or have your students learn about things related to different um, happenings in the world like COVID. What have you seen after COVID versus before COVID in the clothing that's offered or the products that you see? And your students could go into these archives and look before, look after, and see the similarities and the differences. You could assign design houses or designers and have them look up through the store windows to see over time how their products have changed. So there's just so many ways that you could do this. And you don't have to worry about what your students might find if you offered these, these experiences to them or the assignments and you just wanted them to go to the open web. Who knows what will hit and pull up in Windows where you're going to know it's archived and it's limited and your students aren't going to get into material that you know they really shouldn't uh, get into because it's not appropriate for um, classroom use or in, in your students to see. Um, there's So there, this is the link uh, where you'll find things related to the educators. Uh, I have some screenshots I'm going to show you, and then I'm going to go actually into some lesson plans. Uh, have you went to this before, John, with them? Yeah, I, I highlighted them. Okay, so you guys know where it is. Um, so this is where you would go to do, get some general uh, things as, as, well, as well as the national alignment, national standards alignment to the to Windows Wear and what they can bring into the mix. Um, so I'm not gonna spend too much time there, but I know some states and some schools have you be standards-based instruction. And so this is why this alignment was done for you. So you'll be able to see, oh, this is the national standard I know I need to reach. Uh, how, do I, how can I reach that through Windows Wear? And that's what the right-hand column is. 
Of course, you know about the professional development. Uh, obviously, you're at the one in, in summer 2023. The video that they put together, actually, they did at a, at my, at a request that I had to bring back to uh, try to promote it to other to, to other teachers once we we had our experience because it was such a great time and it was such a learning experience for the teachers, as you know, uh, after spending the last couple of days there. So if you're wanting to show your administration or other teachers back in your states uh, what you did, this wouldn't be exactly what you did, but it'll at least capture the main components and that's available through the educators link. The benefits of working with uh, Windowsware is it is industry driven and it's a real world platform. So the industry actually utilizes this. And I know John can share more about what that means. So this is an industry linked resource. It's not an educational group that's trying to recreate something for you to use in, the, in your classroom. This is an actual product that's utilized in industry, which means that it's going to be current, it's gonna be relevant, it's gonna reflect trends, it's going to help you help your students start relationships with industry partners earlier in their careers. There is an opportunity for your students to create a portfolio of their best work uh, and they can link hashtags to that so that and they can it can follow them past high school other rather than the portfolios that you have at your schools you might be required to produ produce if your apparel and textile students could use this portfolio platform, it'll follow them into post-secondary if they go on to college or they can actually become a member as an individual and they'll have access as a professional too. So this is a portfolio that'll be utilized. It's already connected to industry. And uh, I know John can tell you more about the portfolio too if, if you haven't or you want more about that. <clears throat> There's also internship connections for post-secondary students, but your students could already learn about those. At, and if they decide to go into this industry, in a post-secondary way, they'd already know where to go to potentially find uh, internships. And they can catch attention of industry partners through their student portfolios. If they're in bridal and uh, they wanna work for Vera Wang in the bridal department, they could make sure their best practice in their portfolio shows their, their use of croquis and some of the designs they came up with and they could put hashtag Vera Wang. So then it might um, help them get noticed for careers in the future. So there's a lot of academic benefits for your students. For you, instructionally, it is relevant and it's rigorous. It is aligned to the industry. So uh, career and technical education says, you're supposed to be teaching the industry skill set. It's supposed to be a high need field. Um, you're supposed to do re have relevant, rigorous and real world applications in your classroom. You can get all of that through this resource. And we do have the crosswalk like we mentioned already. So it's already started for you. The emergent events like what you went to is, is helping you understand the industry by actually working with the industry, which is what John and Mike, John and Mike are the industry and they know the other people that in the other branches of um, not all of them, but a, but a high percentage uh, and a good variety. So you know what they're telling you is industry related. Um, and all of this is Perkins eligible. Uh, depending on the pathways you have in your state, I know every state does recognize apparel and textiles in some way, some more strongly than others. In Montana, we have our own pathway called Design FCS. Um, in Kansas, we had a pathway, but it fell under human services. Other states have a standalone where it falls under visual arts as the only pathway. So there's different ways in which this can be recognized, but it is recognized. It's just some states aren't promoting it because they don't think it's a high need and that there's no money there and that um, there's no industry in your state. So those are all things that are not true, but hopefully you'll know that now. So um, I'm not going to go over how to start a clothing line uh, curriculum example, but there is um, a resource that I've shared with you here that has uh, some content that you um, might want to reuse it, look at if you're wanting to, to uh, start a clothing line. Um, but I want to focus now with the time that we have on some new resources that um, Windowsware asked me to develop for them. And uh, so I'm going to go into that. But before I do, is there any questions that you have or comments on everything that I've covered so far? Because I've been talk talking to you rather than having a lot of interaction for almost an hour. Are you going to share this? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I'll share this with John. He can share it with the rest of you. <clears throat> any comments? Is there any surprises? Anything that tweaked your brain that you're like, okay, I'm going to go back and do this and that? I like the statistics. So I want to, you know, it's just good to know like real numbers. So I appreciate that. Yeah, it took me a little while to find it, but once I found the information, uh, and that's why I wanted to give you the, the resources so you'll be able to go back and so they don't think you just made them up, that they really did come from, from viable sources. Uh, but good. Anybody else? Hey, I'm just on expanding that a little bit just for a minute. Okay. A lot of other industries, there's a lot of structure with the jobs and the opportunities. Whereas in this industry, it's so unstructured. Mm -hmm. Even something like social media, every brand has social media, the right of social media influencers, the, that entire industry and how influential it is to market the apparel industry and all the brands. And where's the where's all the structure within that industry? You no, know? and that's obviously a very new industry, an inspiring industry, but it's not so structured as many other industries. So absolutely, just even Gail, I'm just you know, compiling that information. It's information that's not so really easily or readily available. It's not really readily understood, but it's extremely helpful to understanding and providing context and structure because a lot of people don't understand this industry and really don't understand it because it's just not structured. Yeah, and, and, and if I can piggyback on that, it's very highly relationship-based. So I worked with a company, uh, this happened to be a Kansas example, because I'm just building my relationships in Montana right now. Um, in the Kansas City area, <clears throat> Jennifer um, Lapka Pfeiffer, who works with a company called Rightfully Sown, and it's actually a nonprofit. And they're, uh, they have a, a number of um, things that they do, but one of the things, one of her goals is to bring back some garment manufacturing into Kansas City. Kansas City used to be one of the uh, main five hubs of manufacturing of garments in, uh, in the history of uh, the industry, especially in the mid 1900s, uh, 1940 through about 1970. Um, <clears throat> and they had some particular design houses that were, for, were based there. And of course, those have all gone away. And so she wanted to bring back um, in a niche market, helping this, this um, budding entrepreneur go from two or three people making product, uh, that middle piece before they could actually afford to have their own manufacturer and production floor of 15, 20, 30 people working full-time making product. So she started an atelier space and was doing small uh, production number uh, uh, requests. So I think her, it's like under a thousand pieces. So some, when they first started out, they made like 200, 300 pieces of uh, particular garments for different budding entrepreneurs. They paid them to make. And so they, so because of that, and because they didn't have a workforce, they did some training and taught sewing and utilizing the certain machines that they would then be using in the atelier space to make production. They actually hired most of the individuals that went through their training. And most of those individuals were women, uh, a high number from foreign countries that didn't speak English very well, but it was to get them out of pov poverty or to keep them out of poverty because most of them were heads of household and had children. So it was really seen as a way of urban renewal um, to employ women at a life-sustaining wage to keep them out of poverty, teach them a technical trade that they could apply right there in the Kansas City area. And now they've expanded from one floor to three floors of a building. <clears throat> so, uh, so, and the building's not, you know, huge by any means. I think there's maybe um, a thousand square feet on each floor. But the point is, they started off with one section of one floor, and now they're all three floors because it's growing so much. So there, she gets Jennifer. Last time I talked to Jennifer, it's been a while, uh, but she said she gets phone calls every week in the United in the, the Midwest asking her for employees that know these technical skills. And some cases, if they don't have a need for their own 
uh, on their atelier in their atelier atelier space uh, for the uh, people they're training, then she'll offer them to uh, other people that are looking for someone that can do work for them that they'll hire. And so that's this relationship piece. They're not good putting it on indeed.com. They're not putting it in some of the more traditional ways that the Kerr cluster model pulls to locate and say something's a high need field. They don't, they're not putting that there's jobs in their industry on those platforms. And that's been the biggest problem then for us to be able to go and say, this is a high need industry because the pushback is, well, where are the jobs? They're not listing them here. Well, that's not how this industry works. It's relationship building. I, I know John, John knows me. He might have an industry that says, we're wanting to expand our education component to consumers. He might say, well, why don't you talk to Gayla because I know she has access to some teachers who know all about education. And so it's that relationship piece and I'm not making that suggestion, John, but just use it in, you know, as a as a um, explanation of how this industry works. <clears throat> so that really makes what I'm trying to do is bring back the attention that this industry needs, uh, because we have students that really like this area. This is my very favorite area to teach when I was in the classroom, and um, I would hate to think about trying to be in the classroom for 20 years and not be able to bring this, these technical skill set and this creativity into the students that I taught. I had a number of kids actually go into this field. Um, so uh, I think it's because they were introduced and saw it was a viable option. Most of them are in the Kansas City area. They didn't move very far from home, but, um, but there is opportunity. Okay, so now I'm gonna go on to the uh, resources. Have you, have you went through these um, very much, John? Uh, well, sorry. Did you go through the syllabus and the unit plans? No. Okay. I just didn't want to spend extra time if uh, we didn't need to. So they asked, I, I provided for them what I thought were some areas under the, um, the, the last two segments that we talked about. So the, um, the branding and the marketing and the sales piece. And so they selected um, these that you see on the screen. I did a syllabus to set out what a course would might look like a semester course it, with these particular themes. And then they uh, asked me if I would write some lessons. And I said, well, could I do a unit plan? Because one lesson isn't necessarily gonna help you develop the skill set or the understanding in your students, but a unit plan would, because that would be multiple lessons built together to achieve a uh, end result of a technical skill and understanding that your students have. So one of them that they selected was foundational design in the fashion industry. And we'll go to these here in a minute. Or actually, I think I'm just gonna go to the branding one for time, but, um, but they're very similar in their formatting. And in the syllabus of foundational design in the fashion industry, really it's talking more about um, <clears throat> a, uh, a window display and a store layout. So it's using the design elements and principles in, in those two platforms. So what I, what I did then is I um, wrote a unit plan that would be foundational in using the elements and principles in merchandising when it came to store layout and um, uh, window displays. Uh, the second one is brand development and marketing not to make you a business teacher, but to give you an understanding if you taught a fashion marketing class or fashion develop, uh, product development class, what would that class look like? And then the particular unit that I was asked to develop was building a brand identity. So how do you build a brand? And having your students understand what makes their product different than someone else uh, is what the intent was. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go to those. I'm going to go to the uh, and show you the syllabus and then the unit plan. And then we're going to end our time together. We'll come back to the slide. And I think you all brought some lesson plans and have you share it. But I, what I'm going to ask you to do is to align which segment you believe that it would fit into if the lesson plan you brought was a re related to apparel and textiles or sewing or something, okay? So you're gonna be thinking about that part. So I'm gonna stop sharing this particular pro, uh, item and I'm gonna pull up the um, curriculum work. <clears throat> and the one I, I pulled up to share with you together is the uh, building brand identity. 
So do you see something that says uh, number six, building brand identity? Yeah. Okay. So let's see if I pulled the right one. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. That's not the syllabus. I want the syllabus first. I am sorry. Let's see. Here we go. Okay, here's the syllabus. So if you're doing a class on brand development and marketing, this is what, um, based on the resources that I found uh, to make it very FCS focused, but also align with, with um, the segments that we're talking about. <laughs> this is uh, what it looks like. So it's a basic um, introduction. Uh, what career clusters that this probably aligns with. Uh, obviously, it's family consumer science focused, and it's a considered an advanced um, um, syllabus. So this is not going to be an intro course. This is going to be something you would probably have your juniors or seniors be involved in because they need to have some basic understanding of other components before they could be as successful in this one. There's pre-knowledge <clears throat> that they need to have, which I've listed here, so that they're able to apply it in the, in the branding uh, class. So again, this is just what an outline would look like if you taught this class, and then I have the unit plan that I'll go to next. So uh, both this set and the other set look exactly the same. So it is going to start at the beginning, uh, stating what career clusters, it's going to state the pre-knowledge. Uh, and then as we go through the actual syllabus for the class uh, level, uh, it'll have the order of instruction, which makes sense because it's building on skill set. The sequencing of the educational experience is going to start in an, more of an introductory way, even though this is an advanced subject, it still needs to have an introduction. And then it's gonna advance and build on the skill set as you go through it. <clears throat> so we have our introduction and our instructional components in the middle. And then I have the national standard that it aligns to on the very right. So you don't have to do any alignment if you're a standard-based instruction school, it's already done for you. Start by what is branding, understanding what that means, basics of a business, especially within fashion, a review of the elements, design, and, pr and principles. This is not teaching them about it. This is, this is a review. So they would need to know the basics before they come into this class. That's why it was listed under pre-knowledge. Then we're going to look at occupations related to brand development and marketing <clears throat> and the skill sets that are listed on those. The brand basics, uh, what are the when you're trying to develop a brand, what, is, what does it mean to get a brand? So if you say um, something is uh, uh, Coco Chanel, and I, I keep using that as an example, um, you're gonna know that brand if you see it um, because of the way they've done these things. <laughs> then you can break it down into the blueprint of how to actually develop the brand, the brand identity, how do you do that? Uh, which includes competitive research, the competitor research and building your own brand. That's actually the um, lesson plan, the uh, unit plan that I did, uh, which we'll go to next. Then about marketing, how do you market? And so I've identified the components under that and then ended with um, some of the resources that I utilized with the links. So you're able to go back and look at those if you feel like you would like to. <clears throat> okay. Any questions on the syllabus before I get into, while well, I pull up the uh, particular um, unit plan? Looks good. Okay. So, did someone say something? Okay. So this is the unit plan and a unit plan is multiple lessons that are focused in a way that is a continuum so at the end, you will have answered the perennial problem, answered the unit problem, you have embedded academics, you have, you've enhanced all of these employability skills and so that you're able to, uh, when the students in, they'll have, a, they'll have an increased understanding and uh, being able to practice the technical skills related to this particular theme, which is building a brand. 
So I started again <clears throat> with the pre-knowledge that's necessary. And if you look at the syllabus, these are some of those things that will have been addressed earlier in the syllabus or earlier in the class, or it's pre-knowledge they might've had in a previous class than this particular one. And you don't have to use the syllabus in order to use these unit plans. You could use these unit plans in any course you already have and not have to use the syllabus. But I know one thing that we needed <clears throat> in uh, my other state, uh, and I always had teachers ask, well, how do I teach this? What would a class look like if I taught a class in this? So that's what I brought to John and Mike is, well, what if we started to talk about what would be in some of these courses first as an outline and then do the unit plan not just do the unit plan without having the other context. So that gives teachers two ways in which to think about addressing this topic. So that's what we did. <clears throat> so here's the pre-knowledge. This is terms because I know some of you have to turn in what terms you're working on each day. So these are the terms that are gonna be discussed in this particular uh, unit plan. One of the things the syllabus did, it did not talk about how much time you would spend on each topics in the unit plan, it is putting the, down the um, expected time frame that it would probably take. You have your instructional component in the middle. You have the national standards like we did with the syllabus and then the supplies and materials you would need in order to do that particular instructional uh, 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 activity or, or present that material or whatever. So I always like to have my bell work be linked somewhere into the unit plan. So you'll see this happening in the two that I developed. In this particular bell work, it's doing a, a national brand analysis by a filling out a table. And so it's telling you, you need to bring five to eight logos printed or have them projected on a shared screen. The students would go to, and then they would do some um, investi investigative work. And at this point, you're not, doing anything with the information. You're just gathering it to kind of tweak their engagement and their interest, and then you'll use it later on. <clears throat> then we go into our actual introduction. Again, it walks you through in the middle section. There's uh, the activities or materials or some optional notes are in the very right-hand column. Uh, first, we start with the brand concept. What is a brand? What does it mean? Um, and it goes into more detail. It talks somewhat about the workforce in the United States, um, some teaching points or some concepts to bring to their attention. Then we're gonna introduce the main concepts <clears throat> within the, um, the branding. There's a class activity, um, and this is uh, targeted toward the audience themselves. They work in table teams. <coughs> You'll need large poster paper and markers. It'll take 20 to 25 minutes is expected. There's also the, the conclusion to bring it all together. Then we'll go into demographics and looking at demographics. There's some pre-work that you would need to do ahead of time having to do with your local community. And there's a link to the census to be able to find your state and your area. <clears throat> 2020 is the, uh, the latest census. Of course, census is done every 10 years. So that's what we, even though it's 2023, we would use uh, the 2020. And the, again, conclusion, then we have another class participation activity talking about niche markets and what that means. <clears throat> I'll give you some examples or some samples. Um, and then again, a conclusion. Then we're looking at oldest US brands still in existence today. Uh, and they started as a niche market. Again, some optional activities along the right-hand side. <coughs> I've included um, information about the 12 earliest U.S. companies, uh, Bork, Bork, the Brooks Brothers, um, Woolwich, Johnson & Murphy, Levi Strauss, Fry. Some of these you'll still recognize. Carter's, Carhartt, Lee, New Balance, Converse, L.L. Bean, and Champion. You see they all started before 1920. And that alone might be really interesting to your students. Then we get into some uh, classroom um, activities using that information. Again, there's your directions, materials you'll need on the right-hand side, some conclusion, um, competitor research. 
and then they actually um, are to work together in teams and develop a new brand. They 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 just find out they they identify or you can identify or have them identify a target audience. What is the niche item they're going to do? They have to develop a mission and vision, their colors, their logo, those things, and then present it. Um, and so you have your summary of how to pull it all together. In FCS, we also are inquiry based. And so I've given you the three levels of questions that we are expected to ask our students so that they're processing the information. We have the technical questions, which is more uh, rote memory. We have the interpretive questions is asking them how you use the information in different ways and reflective is how do you use it in a new way. So it gets through the three levels of uh, concepts uh, in, in working with the material. And again, I've given you the references. <clears throat> So the other um, unit and uh, syllabus for the um, for the class and then the unit is very very much the same format. So <clears throat> questions or comments from the rest of you about that? Any? Any, are you excited? Is there anything about that you think that you might go back and, and utilize? <clears throat> yeah, that was very helpful. That's actually our final project. So it's kind of cool to see how you share kind of like Okay, awesome. And again, as a teacher, you have the flexibility to uh, utilize um, the materials as you want. You being able to teach the the um, class as well as uh, the unit uh, that I shared with you, um, you you will need access to Windows Wear to be able to do that because it refers back to different components <clears throat> and using Windows Wear and some of the things that I had mentioned before the archive uh, or the uh, uh, visiting the virtual field trips they have where they walk into actual uh, brand stores. Um, They'll, they'll need access to those to be able to, to do, you'll need those as, access to those as a teacher, so your students have access to those to be able to, to do the work. Um, so I did want to make sure that and point that out. Um, yeah. yeah, so I'm, I'm done with my section, and so we're going to go to your own lesson plans. <clears throat> so I think what I'm going to do is go back to the PowerPoint. I hope you can see. And I'm going to, if it'll let me, i stop sharing. I'm going to go back to the segment. Let me do this first before I share it with you again. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I'm going to go back to the segment slide and project that while you are figuring out who's going to share what lesson. And uh, then you can, if it's apparel and textiles, could share what segment that it you think it would tie into. So John, I'll let you kind of get organized there and I'll pull this up that particular good. slide. So uh, obviously you, uh, you know, Gail has shared with you guys some lesson plans obviously in a very detailed way, but just want to open it up. Doesn't necessarily have to be highly detailed, but just like high level sort of the lesson plans and things that you've done in the classroom that you thought were very effective, exciting, each one of you teachers at a different school, at a different state, have different experiences, have different types of students. You know, obviously you had the opportunity over the past several days of getting to know each other and having a great time here in New York, but it, you know, it's not mandatory, but if anyone wants to sort of share, you know, something that they've done in the classroom as a way to inspire other teachers here to think about those kind of things. What can you project in segments? It's textile, design, manufacturing, and sales. Okay. This was my first year to be fashion in the classroom. Then I have an apparel merchandising degree, so I shifted from uh, I went from apparel merchandising to insurance to education 17 years ago. So um but one of the things we put on with our school was this year, because I didn't know the direction I wanted to go with it, but to entice the student body outside of my classroom because we produced a fashion show. Some with items that they made, 
which I've been teaching sewing over here, but not a fashion course. And then invited other students to put outfits together that were they felt good in. And then they got modeled. And then so it would let my students do the production of it and kind of get the feel of it and advertise and promote and get to the community. But other than that, I would, that was probably my favorite portion of it because I'm still testing the waters and we still trip a lot because I wanted to gain information to bring into my classroom with it as well. And any other uh, teachers here do fashion shows? Um, prior. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what I was about to say. Uh, still. And I'll just give you my perspective. I, I think fashion students are great. They're obviously component of the industry. For me, myself, personally, who now works in the industry, I'm a 41 year old white heterosexual male. Never would have ever would have thought I'd be in this industry. And I actually think the fashion show was because in college they had fashion shows. Mm -hmm. For the apparel merchandising program at Indiana University, which is somewhat, which I'm actually on the advisory board. So, as amazing as the fashion show is for the students, for someone like me, that didn't attract me. Yeah. I was so, a guy in college. Yeah. So, maybe something else could also be done to like broaden the marketing of the industry. Definitely. Because I do think it. And that's why when I showed you guys like the Tiffany and Company example with the Super Bowl rings, we're thinking about that. Because that will attract, yeah, that will attract a different demographic that might not necessarily know that they would be interested in the industry. Yeah. It's good for me to advertise the program. Yeah, that's cool. When I started at that school 10 years ago, and I had probably any sections. Mm -hmm. And through the years, and then for my fashion show, I have kids that take pictures. And then they're in there, and then you move all the other stuff too. Yeah. Exactly. I'd agree with that for sure. Um, what we've done in the past is like we've had like local companies be our best designer. So they're like, oh, I love that store. I feel like they're like, oh, I'm trying to put some set. And maybe that's the way that you would it. But yeah, I feel like. Yeah, and that was that's for you. We do like Neiman's is a sponsor. I best Pantone the sponsorship dollars, just different vendors and suppliers. Um, and to get other students involved, we use uh, music from the music program or people who want to be music producers. We cross disciplines with other departments to draw in other student bodies. You're right. Like sometimes I wonder is the fashion show. We have to put a lot like working on that now. Yeah. Put the do put so much into it. That's then I wonder about the ROI. I sometimes I'm still in this space. Yeah, because also like uh, you know, like two billionaires, Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos. Sir, their their companies are heavily involved in the fashion industry. So where's the Analytics of the of the e-commerce where they're literally measuring the prices and the reviews and the ratings, the marketing, and also the the Zuckerberg aspect of the social media and the influencers and all that. Yeah, I wonder about it because if I'm working on this now, as y'all all know, if y'all do any kind of showcase, if we're having meetings about this in June for a show that's in May of 2024. It's a lot of lead work. It's a lot of work. And at the end of the night, it's great, it looks good, everybody's a little good. But I'm like, it's probably it's pride. Yeah. <laughs> and some of the students, as y'all are all speaking about, some of them give it their all, some of them not so much. Well, that's, yeah, but my issue is they're yeah. anxiety. Yeah. And it's pretty, 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 I know, I know that some some of you were talking about fashion shows. Um, if you step back just a minute, you could involve multiple CTE partners in this and make it a real showcase for the whole your whole CTE wing. For example, um, if you have uh, uh, construction trades. 
area. They could potentially do the back the the, the building of the backdrop or a ramp. Um, if you dev developed your uh, academic teachers, like your art teacher, they could maybe actually, if you had a theme, they could actually maybe design and paint the backdrop that the construction department built. Um, <clears throat> you could potentially have um, your business department actually do the marketing of the, and involve your students because they need to know this too, um, of the pro of the fashion show to the to the community um and you could potentially i mean you could make this into a bigger event and even maybe have booth space for some of your local individuals um maybe you have a um, a place that does hair and makeup and they would do the hair and makeup of your models for free and they could have a table where they could put their cards out you know to try to gather more um more business i mean there's just a variety of things you could potentially do you could have a florist maybe they would do some floral bouquets so then they could have a booth um you know there's just a, a number of depending on the size of your community you could get a number of people involved and, and really make this where everyone is showcasing kind of their own uh, things, but it would be real world. If you think about it from your construction trades program, this would be a real world industry experience for them. You yourself might be a, a culinary teacher or you might be in a school big enough that you have a culinary teacher. They could do some food uh, potentially for this. Or you might have some businesses that actually do um, uh, hors d'oeuvres or charcuterie boards or something that would might want to work with you and bring the attention, you know, to their catering business, their catering side. So think about it, not so much of you having to do all the work, but how you might turn this into a bigger thing. And it actually would then bring more act, um, recognition to your program in, in this particular, pro this uh, area, apparel and textiles, because you could make part of your program talk about the industry need and that entrepreneurship is so big and online sales should be included and in just because you don't have brick and mortar stores in your little town doesn't mean people aren't buying clothing by driving to the next town or buying stuff online so <clears throat> there's a variety of ways you could utilize other people so that it doesn't seem like it's such a daunting task on your end well that's how my classes are doing last year we did like the business students did all that fighting, like they made commercials, the, the flyers, like that was like a huge headache that I didn't feel like, like another teacher helped with. And then it kind of like recruited his students too, being like, oh, fashion is just done, you know? And then the copy students took photos at the show, and then also during the process as well, our digital arts people made a logo for the fashion show. Uh, we have a big tag program. So like they have floral classes and they all floral arrangements. Uh, we had a local like uh, makeup school, hair and makeup school come. They did all the hair and makeup for free. Um, I love that because it's one of the students realize that what all industries yeah. are in fashion. Like I focus so much to say that we are a STEM class. Yeah, that's so mm -hmm. Oh yeah, you definitely are. We are a STEM course. Yeah, we're engineers. And so when they start looking at um, Whoa, somebody programmed this to make this or someone's technology behind a computer that allowed this to auction. Yeah. And so I think it's real important. And I that's probably my beginning course to work on any of the classes that I teach. We are a STEM course. Yeah. And then we're like, oh, we don't have to take so many different classes. Yeah. You know. Yeah, we use our culinary department. Yeah. And a beta institute. Uh, and another local community college in Dallas. And this time, but we won't start waiting because we went on a massive tour during the pandemic. We used to be Dallas County Community College with several campuses. Now we're one college, Dallas College with several campuses. So we kind of lost our people, but we requested a subcommittee from the foundation department of our district. So they're taking all the work off our plate because as y'all talking about, it's too hard to teach. The anxiety, finals, graduation, all that. The music. <laughs> all that comes out. Exactly. So you just had to do this. 
my my biggest thing was recruiting male population for my program. Um, so what we actually do is a fashion show where the students like create whatever is we do the pop up shop right before coming to prom, and my students are in charge of the display and the modeling, helping the students choose those elements, and the guys are really into it because they these students really nice. And then we have a community program that does for free for low income. So it's they can come in and shop for free instead of purchasing it. So my students like work it and then they piece it together and display. Um, but that's been my biggest thing of getting awesome. So <clears throat> I know you're having some rich conversation and I'm looking at the time and I know you have lunch here and not uh, not too far from this time frame. I think I, you only have like about 15 minutes, but I do want to to end by by looking at these four segments and really challenging you. We do need to talk about the raw product and where it comes from, and part of that's the manufacturing of the of the fibers when we're talking about textiles and the design. We know about we know what that means. But we also need to make sure that we give the manufacturing and the promotion and sales the attention that it needs so that the end of it, so the students understand when we're talking about the industry, it's not just designing. It's not just pattern making. It's it's more than that. It's it's everything that goes along with with what they have on their bodies and what will be available in the future. <clears throat> so that's my challenge to you all is to figure out how can you not just focus on one of these segments, but do all of those, because that's that multidisciplinary component of the industry that we've lost uh, in the past because of the of the crew cluster model. And, and just so you know, I'm, I'm actually advocate, advocating for uh, this industry with this new crew cluster review that's happening right now. Um, so that multidisciplinary piece and that multi-level component of this industry has got to be introduced to our students so they understand that sequencing that is, is captured in this particular slide. So thank you so much for letting me spend a couple hours with you this morning. Um, I'm so very excited about the possibility of being in person next year. Um, love you, New York City, and uh, Mike and John are fantastic. And, um, <clears throat> And I very much appreciate in and awe of all that they do and because they're always moving and they're always they're so creative and they're always adding to. So I know there's more to the website. And those of you that are attending um, uh, with a subscription to their service, I know there'll be some follow ups with how to get online and how to start a portfolio for your students and those types of things. So thank you very much for letting me be a part of your morning and I'll entertain any last questions or John, if we get off the phone and they have additional questions, you can just shoot them to me on my phone. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so we're going to spend the next 15 minutes just continuing to discuss with the teachers. Okay, that sounds fine. Thanks, right. everybody. Good Bye. to see you. Bye-bye.